Come Holy Spirit, move mightily in this place, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, would you turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, which I will read in a moment. This is the final part of our sermon series in Revelation chapter 1 to 3, where we've been reading seven letters written to churches in the early church age. And I hope that you've noticed a pattern as we've been reading those letters together, that every letter contains a vision of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Every letter contains an encouragement for something that the church is doing well. And every letter contains a challenge for an area to improve, something that they need to be reminded of. And then there's a picture of the new heavens and the new earth to come, and and each church is reminded that those who persevere, those who keep the faith in Jesus, will be conquered conquerors, our conquerors in Christ. Well, as we read this final letter, we'll notice something unique. Jesus has nothing positive to say to Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 onwards. In fact, this letter that we're about to read poses a very, very sobering question. And here's the question for us to answer for ourselves this morning. Has wealth has material prosperity, has comfortable lives made us useless for Jesus? Has your comfortable life made you complacent, lazy, apathetic, spiritually lukewarm for Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross? That's the question this passage poses. Well, let us read it together. Revelation chapter 3. Verses 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realising that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may, may not be seen and the salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, as Jesus begins, as Jesus begins this letter written to Laodicea, Jesus describes himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I'm getting quite a lot of feedback here, guys. So, um, yeah. Jesus describes himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, we use that word Amen, don't we, at the end of our prayers. It literally means truly. So when you say Amen at the end of someone else's prayer, you're saying truly. That what they've prayed, I agree with that that's true. That's a truthful account of what is true about who God is. And also it's how I feel and it's what I want to see happen. So when you say amen, you're saying I agree, truly, truly. You're saying at the end of a prayer. But on two occasions in the Bible, amen is used as a name of God. Here in Revelation chapter 3 and also in Isaiah 65 verse 16. God is called the God of our men. It's translated God of truth, but the literal Hebrew there is God of our men. And in Isaiah 65, that name of God is associated with the truth of God's promises. So God is making a promise to his people in Isaiah 65. He's saying in verse 17, behold, I'm going to make the new heavens and the new earth. 
there's going to be a day when pain and sickness and death have all gone and we will enter into the new heavens and the new earth. And I want you to know that this promise is true. I want you to know that this promise is secure, that I will not turn back on my words. What I have promised will come. So I want you to know that I am the God of our men. I am the God of truth. That's what Isaiah 65 is all about. It's a magnificent promise that we have to trust God on. Well, it's the same here in Revelation chapter 3. When Jesus is introduced as the Amen, he's being introduced as the one who speaks truth. You've got to believe these words because the Amen has spoken them. The truly one, the true one, the one who makes promises and fulfills them, the one who never fails to fulfill his promises. And that is why Jesus is also described as the faithful and true witness. As Jesus witnesses against the church of Laodicea, he is being faithful and true. The words that he say are true, excellent, faithful descriptions of this church in Laodicea. Jesus is the Amen, the faithful and true witness. His words, his promises are sure. Now I want to encourage you that this is tremendously encouraging for us when we pray. I want to encourage you to pray to the God of our men and repeat his promises back to him. Pray prayers like this. God of our men, Lord Jesus, the faithful and true witness. You say in your word in Luke chapter 11 that the Holy Spirit, uh, sorry, the heavenly father will give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask. That's a promise in your word and you are the amen. And so I'm taking your words to be faithful and true and I'm praying that Lord God right now, would you do that for me? I want the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want him to dwell within me. I want him to move powerfully in me and I'm trusting that you are the God of the amen and that your words are faithful. I'm taking your promise and I'm praying it out and believing it because you're the God of the amen. Or maybe a different promise. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. So you pray that. You say, God, you are the God of the Amen. Your promises are sure. And you promise in your word that when we ask for wisdom, you will give generously without reproach. So I'm clinging to that promise, Lord. I need wisdom in this life situation. I'm believing that promise. Would you, God of our men, would you, Jesus, faithful and true witness, would you do, give me this gift of wisdom in my life? Do you pray like that? Do you take the promises of God and and believe that God is the God of our men, that he speaks the truth, that his promises can can be prayed in? I'd encourage you to do that. Jesus being the Amen is tremendously encouraging in prayer. But it's also sobering when we read the Bible, when we read God's word. Next time you pick up the Bible, I hope it's very, very soon, I would encourage you to pray before you start reading the words and maybe say something like this. God of our men, God of truth, faithful and true witness, what I'm about to read is truth because you have spoken it. May I receive it like that. Even if culture says something different, Lord, you're the God of truth, so I want to believe what I'm about to read. Even if actually it challenges me and asks me to change the way I'm living life, Lord, I want to read this as though the God of our men has spoken it to me. Do you see, it's it's tremendously encouraging in prayer to cling to the promises of God and say, I know they're true because God has spoken. But it's also deeply challenging when we're reading God's word to receive this as the truth of the faithful and true witness, Jesus Christ speaking to us. And of course, here in Revelation 3 verse 14, if you are sat in the church of Laodicea listening to these words, it is a sobering moment for you. And And this church and us are to receive these words as though they are true. They're spoken by the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, Jesus in verse 14 is also described as the beginning of creation. And that phrase does not mean that Jesus was the first thing created, because we know that Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is uncreated. He is the creator through whom all things were created. And that's what it could be referencing. It could be saying Jesus is the faithful and true witness because he is the one who created everything. He knows what he's talking about. He's the creator. But actually, I think here, because of the connection with Isaiah 65 and because of a very similar verse in Revelation 21, I think Revelation 3.14 is actually about the new creation. Jesus died on the cross. He was placed in the tomb. But on the third day, he rose again. And in that sense, he is the beginning of the new creation. And we will all follow in his footsteps and enter into the new creation. So he's the beginning of the new creation to come. And that's another reason to believe every word he says. He is the one who died and the one who rose again. 
Now that is someone who I put my trust in, someone who rose from the grave. That is, every other world religion invented by a, a man who is now dead, right? But Christianity is, is, was given to us by a man who died and then rose again. He is the beginning of the new creation and therefore his words are sure. He is the faithful and true witness. What he says is true. Well, what does he say to this Laodicean church? He says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Well, this verse is traditionally interpreted and preached to concern spiritual zeal for God. Christians should be white hot on fire for Jesus, growing in love for him, giving everything in service to him. But many people in churches are lukewarm. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Jesus, yeah, he's a, he's a decent guy, but you know, I'm a Christian when it suits me. But that's a really important challenge, isn't it? Are you a lukewarm Christian? Or are you on fire for Jesus, white hot? You love him. You're giving everything. Or are you spiritually lukewarm? And if you feel like that's true, then pray for the zeal of the Lord. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to transform you, to to act like a heater in your life so that you start warming up to love Jesus more and more. But there's actually some other things going on in this verse. And I want us to dig deeper into this verse. Because Laodicea had a particular context, which means this verse means even more than that. So nearby, in a place called Hieropolic, there were hot springs good for bathing. You went there, you know, maybe you've been on holiday to places where they have natural hot springs, and you just think these are fantastic and and healing and life-giving and wonderful places, and everyone would go there for that, for the hot springs. But that water that people were bathing in there would flow down. Jeff told me down an aqueduct, um, but I thought it was a river, but an aqueduct to Laodicea, where it would cool down as it was flowing and it would become lukewarm, not good for bathing in, and certainly not good water to drink. Dirty bath water that had gone a a little bit lukewarm. That's what they had in Laodicea. That was what the river was was bringing to them in this town. In fact, there's historical evidence that there was a big water problem in Laodicea and the water would cause nausea, unsurprisingly, (laughs) given that these guys were bathing in it further upstream and then they were drinking it. It would be water that you would want to spit out. Now in Colossae, which was a nearby town, they had cold water, pure, that was good to drink. And so if you went to Colossae, it was like, wow, this water is so cool and refreshing and brilliant, life-giving. This is the water that you want to put in your body. But if you were in Laodicea, this is water that you want to spit out that's going to make you ill, that's going to make you feel sick. So Jesus is saying to the Laodiceans, you're just like your water. You're useless. You're good for nothing. Your Christianity is nausea-inducing. There's another kind of angle on this description as well. If you look in verse 20, Jesus, in verse 20, is knocking on a door, waiting to be invited in for dinner. Now imagine you do open the door to Jesus and you serve him a drink. And you can either give him a nice hot cup of tea and he, oh, I'm so welcome in this place, says Jesus. Or you can give him a refreshing, cool glass of water that oh, I'm so relaxed and refreshed. Or you can give him a lukewarm, nausea-inducing glass of water and Jesus goes, well, I'm not welcome here. I'm not going to stick around. This is what Jesus is saying to the church in Laodicea. Your church is uninviting to me. Your religion is useless. It's good for nothing. I'm going to hang out in Colossae. I'm going to hang out in Heropolis. Now, why is it that the Laodicean Christianity is so nausea-inducing? Well, the answer is idolatry. Jesus isn't number one in their lives. And you can see what has replaced Christ at the top of the food chain in verse 17. It's wealth, riches and prosperity. The Laodiceans say, I am rich. I have prospered. 
I need nothing, including Christ. I need nothing, they're saying. They're focused on wealth and they've got enough and they're going, well, we, we don't need Jesus. We've got everything we need. Look at my clothes. They're fantastic. Look at my, look at my house. I have shelter. I have food. I have everything I need. I'm rich. That prompts a very serious question and something which I think is a danger in the UK church. Has wealth has comfortable living, has having everything you need made you useless for Jesus? Have you ever thought or said, well, I don't, I don't really need, I don't need anything. I've got everything I need in, in my house and possessions and wealth. Have you ever thought like that? You know, the truth is that there are many Christians living in poverty in this world and often they are more zealous for Christ than those people living in comfort. They have a greater need for Jesus and therefore they depend upon him for everything and therefore they build a close relationship with Jesus and they have a greater passion in the Christian life. Therefore, I want to ask you to watch yourself. Examine yourself. And ask yourself whether material wealth and comfort are more important to you than Jesus Christ. If I looked at your bank statement, would it tell me that you are passionate about Jesus? You're passionate about the church. You love to bless the poor. You love to see the gospel proclaimed. Or would it tell me that you love comfort, possessions and material wealth? If I looked at your afternoon or evening plans today, if I looked at your priorities this week, would it say that you love Jesus, that you're passionate about him, that he is your everything? Or would it say that you love spending time with the things that you've managed to build up for yourself on this earth? You know, we sung these words today. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Were you just singing those words because they were put on the screen or did you really mean them? That the riches of Christ's love is enough for you and nothing compares to his embrace. Those are big words, aren't they, to sing? And you sung them this morning, if you were singing along with us. Did you really mean them? Do you really think that nothing compares to the embrace of Jesus Christ? And would I think that if I looked at your life? I'm asking the same questions to myself. Look at what Jesus says to the Laodicean church church in this passage. They're saying, I'm rich. I have everything I need. And Jesus says, you are wretched. You're not blessed. You're not happy. You're not on top of the world. You're You're wretches. Then he says, you are pitiable. Not envied. You know, you might, you might have wealth, but we, people don't, we don't envy you. No, real Christians don't envy you. They pity you because you have material wealth but do not have Jesus. You know, another good test for you to ask yourself today on whether possessions are an idol for you is, do you spend your time wishing you had other people's wealth and possessions? Coveting other people's possessions? Or do you pity people who are rich but do not have Christ? The richest man in the world without Jesus is not to be envied, but to be pitied. Jesus says, you are poor. You think you're rich. You're saying you're rich. But if you, if you don't have Jesus, then you are the poorest you can possibly be. If you have no earthly possessions, but you have Jesus, you are richer than a billionaire without Christ. Jesus says you are blind to these people. You cannot see with spiritual eyes how temporary material possessions are. And you cannot see how much Christ is of infinite value compared to earthly possessions. You're blind. You're blind. Jesus says you are naked. You're not clothed in the righteousness that comes from Christ. You're not clothed in good deeds. You're naked. You think you've got really nice fine clothes in Laodicea, but you do not. From Jesus' point of view, the Laodicean church are in seriously bad shape. These are not, these are not words that are gentle, <laughs> are they? They are hard-hitting words spoken to this church. And the question is, is there any hope for them at all? You know, I am the Amen, the faithful and true witness. You are wretched and blind and poor. 
But anyway, that, that's a letter you do not want to receive. Is there any good news for this church? Is there any good news for us? If we're sitting there thinking, actually, yeah, I am living a comfortable life. I'm not red hot for Christ. I have idolised wealth and possessions. Is there any good news for us? Well, I think the answer in, 18, in verses 18 to 22 is definitely yes. In fact, I think there are three pieces of good news contained in those verses that should hopefully lift us from this place of conviction, I hope, into a place of, oh, I want to be on fire for Christ in my life. Let me tell you what those three things are. Firstly, in verse 19, there is an emphatic call to repentance. Look at verse 19 with me. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and rep repent. You know, when Christ is speaking to the church in Laodicea, he, he is speaking as though there are genuine Christians in this church for whom Christ died on the cross, who are going to hear these words and repent. And so Jesus is speaking to those Christians in love because he cares about them. He's bringing these seemingly harsh words because he loves them so much. He wants them to turn their life around and follow him. Do you see Jesus disciplines the one he loves? This isn't a message from Christ of hate and condemnation. This is a message of love, calling these people to change the way they're living. He's saying, repent, turn around, stop being lukewarm, start being zealous, passionate, on fire for Christ. And verse 18 provides the counsel on what repentance needs to look like for these people. They need to stop saying that they are rich. And they need to come buy gold from Jesus himself. And that gold refined by fire is a metaphor for faith. Jesus is saying, stop placing your trust in your wealth and possessions and rely upon me. Put your faith in me. Trust in me. That's what it is to come and get gold from Christ himself. Your faith, if you are a Christian and you have faith in Jesus, your faith is like Christ giving you this gift of gold that has been refined by fire. I don't know how carrots work in gold. I haven't planned to say this, so I should have done some research. But I don't know, do, the more carrots the better, is that true? Yeah, so a billion carat gold is what your faith is like, Christ giving you this gold refined by fire. There's going to be a response at the end. I'm going to invite people to come forward and do that as a way of saying, my faith is way more important to me than riches. I want this gold, I want greater faith in Christ. I want this a billion carat gold that has been refined by fire. Well, the Laodiceans also need to stop admiring their fine clothes and great fashions and wake up to the fact they're naked without Christ. They need to come and receive from Jesus white garments of righteousness. When you come to Christ as a, as a non-Christian, when you come and believe in him for the very first time, what he gives you is the gift of righteousness. You are no longer guilty before God, but you receive Christ's goodness. He gives it to you. He, he wraps it round you like a, a wonderful white garment and says, you are righteous in my sight. So the billionaire who's got the most amazing earthly clothes is naked because they haven't received the righteousness of Christ. But if you are a Christian, you have received, you know, think of a wedding dress. Even blokes, you can think of yourself wearing this glorious white garment wedding dress. That's what Christ has given you if you've come to him to believe in him to receive righteousness. And actually, we, as Christians, full of the Holy Spirit, we're to, we're to um, adorn ourselves in good works as well. So we go around loving people and showing joy and kindness. And, and so we clothe ourselves as well. In a sense. So you've received this righteousness from Christ and that's what's going to get you into heaven. But as Christians, having received righteousness, you, you long to worship Jesus. And so you live out good works and that becomes part of your dress as well in some sense. So stop admiring your fine clothes and start receiving righteousness from Christ. Stop being blind and come and receive the opening of your spiritual eyes. Come receive the salve of anointing. See with Christ's eyes. There's a whole bunch of Christians, Christians, who have lived in comfort for far too long and need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to what a life following Jesus really looks like. And again, when I call you forward, maybe that's you. You're saying, I've, I'm comfortable. I want the Holy Spirit to open my eyes to what greater passion and greater zeal really looks like for me. I want that salve of anointing to be placed upon my eyes from Christ. So Jesus in love says 
to the Laodicean church and says to us, Christ Church Fairham, repent, be zealous. And many of us need to heed that word and respond this morning. I know that I do not want to be a lukewarm Christian. I want to be zealous for God. Every moment, every penny, everything that I am in service to the one who gave everything for me on the cross. Not because I can pay him back. I can never pay him back. But I love him and I want to give everything for him because that's where the greatest joy is to be found in following him. I want to be red hot or I want to be refreshing, really cool and life-giving in my walk with Christ. I want to say, I want people to say hanging out with Duncan is like drinking the most wonderful glass of water. That's, I want to be either red hot for Christ with my passion and my zeal or callingly, refreshingly life-giving like the cold water in Colossae. That's the first good news, that there's an invitation to repent. It's not kind of... I'm not interested in you anymore. It's repent and be zealous. The second piece of good news in those verses is the character of Jesus Christ in those verses. In verse 19, he loves these people. He loves them. Jesus doesn't hate these people in Laodicea because of the way they've acted. He loves them. And it's the same with people here. If you're feeling that just, just sharp pain of conviction in your heart right now, that is not because Jesus hates you. It's because he loves you and he wants what's best for you. So that conviction is his love working itself out in your heart. Jesus loves you and therefore he's calling you to a better, more wonderful, more useful Christian walk. And you can see his love exemplified in verse 20. He's standing at the door and knocking for these people in this church. And he is knocking at your door right now. If you're a non-Christian, if you don't believe in Christ, Jesus is knocking at your door right now and saying, hey, I want to eat with you. I want to give you the meal of forgiveness. I want to give you the gift of everlasting life. I want you to know eternal salvation. I want you to know and be loved by God. I'm knocking at your door. Will you open the door to me today? And if that is you, I would say receive Jesus. Get up and open the door in a spiritual sense. Say, Christ, I need you. Please come in. And he will answer that prayer. And if you're a Christian, Jesus is knocking at your door as well right now. Jesus is saying, I'm here to eat with you. I'm here to take you deeper in your faith. I'm, I'm here to call you into deeper passion and zeal in your work with, walk, walk with Jesus. There's a more exciting adventure for you. There's less comfort, but more faith. There's less material wealth, but more spiritual fruit. There's less reliance on money, but more thrill ride, clinging to Christ to come. Will you let me in, says Jesus. You know, two weeks ago, Jeff, Jeff spoke about God opening doors, right? But this is a door that we have to open if you read this passage. Christ is the one knocking and he said, you've got to get up and open the door. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And, you know, when, we don't have a door to open, but as, when you respond, I want you to, See, standing up and coming forward as your opening door moment to say, yeah, I'm opening the door to Christ. I want more faith. I want to live this life that Christ is calling me to in this passage. Be positive and take action, I would encourage you. There's one final and third encouragement in these verses in verse 21. For Christian believers, for those who open the door to Jesus Christ, the reward in the new heavens and the new earth will be to reign with Christ. The Father shares his throne with the Son. After Jesus ascends into heaven, so Jesus dies on the cross, he rises from the grave, he ascends into heaven, and then the Father shares his throne with the Son and they reign together. What he says in this verse is astonishing because he says, just like that, the Son, Jesus, says, I will share my throne with you, Christian." You conquerors, you ones who open the, you, you Christians who enter into the new heavens and the new earth, you will reign with me. Every Christian will in some sense reign in the new creation. He will reign over a portion of the earth, and that will be yours. 
that Christ has trusted to you to reign over. You'll reign over angels. Angels will serve us in the new heavens and the new earth. So you will, re- you, you will sit, in a sense, on the throne with Christ. Not that you will usurp him in any way, shape or form, but he shares his ruling authority with you in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what this life is preparing us for, to reign in eternity. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that magnificent? So this is what I want to say. Don't settle for riches here and now in this life. Don't, don't settle for that but choose to reign in the eternal life to come. That's my attitude, I hope, to wealth and possessions in this life, that I'm not settling for them and I'm choosing instead to forsake them in order that I might reign with Christ in eternity. I think that's a biblical attitude. I want to invite us to stand together. Do you want to open the door to Christ for the first time or once again this morning? Do you want to confess that you've slipped into lukewarmness and you want greater zeal and passion for Christ in your life? Is money and possessions and wealth an idol for you that's holding you back? Is your comfort keeping you in a safe space and Jesus has a greater adventure for you? Is your comfortableness making you less useful for Christ? Do you want the salve of anointing to open your eyes this morning? Well, if that's you, I would like you to move now and come forward. And we will pray for you all at the front. But if you want to respond to any of that, I want you to take action. Imagine you're getting up and opening the door right now. I'm going to invite you to move now, please.